In the shadow of a fledgling nation, the Astor family emerged as architects of the American dream, weaving their ambitions with the threads of opportunity to become the United States' first multimillionaires. With John Jacob Astor at the helm, a vision of prosperity was realized through astute investments in fur and the burgeoning landscapes of New York real estate. This foundation would not only secure their fortune, but also inscribe their names into the heart of American society. Under the watchful eye of Mrs. Astor, the social fabric of New York was meticulously crafted, setting standards of elegance and exclusivity that defined the echelons of high society. The Astor's saga didn't halt at the shores of America. Their influence extended across the Atlantic, intertwining with British aristocracy through calculated marital alliances, further elevating their status and embedding their legacy in the cultural lexicon of wealth and prestige. This is the story of how ambition, strategy, and an unyielding quest for greatness etched the Astor name into the very soul of an evolving nation. The year, 1848. The locale, New York City, humming with life, yet the Astor mansion stood in a cold contrast, its aura of regality offering a muted hush. John Jacob Astor, his legendary family's first magnate, lay on his bed, life flickering like a dying candle. The bed, resplendent in silk and rich mahogany, was an ironic setting for a man who began his journey in the ruggedness of Waldorf, Germany, and the son of a simple butcher. His saga, powered by a monumental spirit, led him across the Atlantic, driven by dreams too large for his small German hamlet. From fixing musical instrumentals to peddling fur, from dabbling in fledgling real estate to mastering finance, he embroidered his success into the fabric of a new world, weaving a legacy in golden threads. Now his son William stood sentinel at his bedside, eyes hard, matching his father's steel. An understanding passed between them, as silent as the room, and as profound as the coming inheritance. Make it grow, William, the old Astor rasped, a lifetime of victories and struggles faintly echoing in his voice. Yet little did he know that his earthly departure would not mark the end of an era, but the beginning. It would be not only an immense fortune he passed on to his son, William, but the seeds of a transatlantic empire. In today's video at Old Money Luxury, we shall recount the incredible true life story of the Astors, America's first old money family, from the dusty roads of rural Germany, to the hallowed halls of Westminster, to the affluent avenues of the city that never sleeps. So settle in and join us as we describe how the Astor family went from new money to old money. In the rural enclave of Waldorf, nestled near the regal city of Heidelberg, now part of contemporary Baden-Württemberg, Germany, a son was welcomed into the world in 1763. The newborn, christened John Jacob Astor, was the youngest scion of Johann Jacob Astor, a humble butcher, and Maria Magdalena von Berg. At the tender age of 16, John Jacob departed his home for the bustling city of London, where he fell under the tutelage of his uncle in the art of crafting musical instruments. Our lovely English capital, in its grandeur, not only provided Astor with proficiency in English, but also a robust apprenticeship in the realm of commerce. The year 1784 marked Astor's embarkation to the United States, his pockets filled with little more than hopes and a collection of several flutes for sale. He chose New York City as his new home, where he opened a small but ambitious shop trading in furs. The 1794 Jay Treaty, which allowed Americans to trade in Canada, served as a catalyst from which to build the empire that would come to create America's first old money family. By the turn of the century, Jacob had accumulated a fortune of $6 million, an eye-watering amount of wealth for an era where America was less than 20 years old and reigned as the luminary of the fur trade. He then diversified his portfolio, trading furs for Chinese tea and investing in Manhattan's burgeoning real estate market, becoming a notable figure in fur transactions in China. Additionally, John Jacob's brother Henry, an enthusiast of equine racing and a German immigrant like himself, purchased a thoroughbred messenger who had journeyed from England to America in 1788. This noble steed would sire all standard bred horses in America adding a unique chapter to the Astor family legacy. Now, the demise of Meriwether Lewis in 1809 ignited a quest for an able governor for the area. Astor saw an opportunity, 
proposing a daring plan to monopolize and extend the fur trade to the Pacific. His venture employed Wilson Price Hunt, a St. Louis businessman, to lead an overland expedition to the Columbia River. The journey, though fraught with disastrous decisions, inadvertently led to seminal discoveries and paved the path known today as the Oregon Trail. This venture formed the bedrock for American development of Oregon and Washington. You see, Astor's empire held a near monopoly on the fur trade, and by the 1820s it stood as one of the largest enterprises in the nascent United States. Yet, by 1834, the illustrious Astor exited the company he had built, partially due to a shift in fashion trends leading to the decline of fur's popularity, causing the company to fragment. However, by then, Astor had already acquired the title of America's very first multimillionaire and the world's richest man. Now, John Jacob Astor's demise on the 29th of March, 1848, marked the end of an era. With a fortune worth a staggering $20 million, Astor passed as the richest person in America. To give a perspective on how wildly large this fortune was in today's terms, if we compare Astor's wealth to the gross national product of America at that time, his net worth would be similar to a 2023 sum of $121 billion, competing with only the likes of Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk on the world stage. And John Jacob's penchant for philanthropy was equally illustrious, dedicating $400,000 from his coffers to the establishment of the Astor Library, the esteemed institution that would later coalesce with the Lenox Library to become the iconic New York Public Library. Now his firstborn son, John Jr. from birth, was plagued by a disheartening blend of ill health and mental issues, thus leading to John Jacob's will giving him an allowance just adequate to assure his sustenance in the uncertain times ahead. Therefore, the lion's share of the Astor's immense wealth, coupled with the destiny of their family empire, was bestowed upon the capable shoulders of his second son, William, thus positioning the next move on the grand chessboard towards old money dominance the Astor family would play in this game of familial intrigue. Now, William Backhouse Astor Sr., named after William Backhouse, his father's merchant friend, over the course of his life would prove his mettle as a competent associate in his father's prosperous export enterprise, all while carefully injecting capital into Manhattan's fertile soil of real estate. Emboldened by his family's already legendary business reputation, William amplified the empire's real estate portfolio, erecting over 700 stores and homes in the growing New York City. His real estate ventures around Central Park yielded exponential growth for the family assets, Understand William, an astute operator himself, not merely preserved, but managed to multiply the Astor family fortune. His diligent endeavors led to even more prosperity for their lineage, his legacy culminating in a staggering estate valued at nearly $50 million. It was as though Midas himself had passed his golden touch onto the next Astors, and they wielded this gift with expert precision. However, in the long arc of family law, the most crucial move William made was a defining characteristic of old money dynasties, strategic intermarriage. On the 20th day of May in the year 1818, he took the hand of Miss Margaret Alida Rebecca Armstrong, the children of Senator John Armstrong Jr. and Elida, sister to Horatio Gates Armstrong. From her mother's side, she claimed lineage from the renowned Livingston clan, her own mother the youngest offspring of the eminent judge Robert Livingston and his wife Margaret. Furthermore, her pedigree included such luminaries as founding father Robert R. Livingston and Secretary of State Edward Livingston. On the other side, her father, John Armstrong Jr., held the distinguished title of President James Madison's second Secretary of War. From this impressive brood, William and Margaret's offspring would include a shockingly impressive third generation of Astors to steer their colossal empire. John Jacob Astor III, born during a balmy summer's day on the 10th of June in 1822, would thrive as an American financier, generous benefactor, and a soldier in the American Civil War. His extraordinary business acumen served to bolster his personal fortune, much like his father and grandfather, eventually earning him the title of the richest amongst the Astor lineage from his generation. By the end of his reign, he would come to grow the family coffers to a stratospheric range between $75 million and $100 million, around $2.5 to $3.5 billion in today's dollars. 
Though again, we must remember that this was a time when the US had a much lower GDP than we have today, thus indicating that $3 billion back then may be closer to 80 or 90 billion relative to today's economies. John III's proudest achievement, however, lay in the establishment of the English branch of the Astor dynasty. It was this branch that cemented the Astor name amongst the British nobility, an enduring legacy that even to this day continues to take pride of place in the aristocratic circles, and we'll cover more in a minute. Now, William and Margaret's daughter, Laura Eugenia Astor, born in 1824, married to a man by the soon-to-be conspicuously American name of Franklin Hughes Delano, on the 17th of September, 1844. This unforeseen twist of destiny would link the Astors with another echelon of the closest thing America has to royalty, the Roosevelts. Franklin Hughes was, after all, the namesake of a certain US president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This union also reinforced the Astors' ties with America's founding stock, given Franklin Hughes Delano's lineage traced back to Philip Delano a pilgrim who set foot in Plymouth, Massachusetts in 1621. Our tale now settles upon William Astor Jr., the bearing carrier of his forefather's illustrious American legacy. Yet it was actually his wife, the imposing Caroline Shermerhorn, who would seize the reins of New York's elite, sculpting the bedrock of its high society. Born to the privileged echelons of New York's Dutch aristocracy on September 22, 1830, Caroline, or Lina, as she was affectionately known, was a Shermerhorn, offspring of the city's earliest settlers. Her father, Abraham Shermerhorn, had made his fortune in shipping and possessed a net worth of half a million dollars, a significant sum for the time, equivalent to $13.74 million today. Helen Van Cortland, nay white, of the prominent Shermerhorns, was her mother. Fate entwined Caroline Shermerhorn and William Astor Jr., the grandson of John Jacob Astor, in a harmonious union in 1853. An intriguing piece of history unfolded in 1862, when the couple commissioned a fashionable four-bay brownstone townhouse at 355th Avenue, an address that would later be home to none other than the Empire State Building. Now, contrary to popular perception that she was always more focused on high society than family, Mrs. Astor, for a considerable part of her years as a mother of young children, devoted herself to her family and household management. Additionally, a hefty inheritance from her parents afforded her a level of financial independence uncharacteristic for women of her era. As the years passed, Caroline Astor's sphere of influence, aptly known as the 400, emerged as a cornerstone of New York's Gilded Age society. You see, the city's population had swelled dramatically post-Civil War, with wealthy migrants and immigrants challenging the traditional stronghold of the New York elite. Teaming up with the revered social arbitrator, Ward McAllister, a kin of Samuel Cutler Ward, who had joined the Astor clan through marriage, Mrs. Astor began to shape the rules of decorum and select the acceptable newcomers to their esteemed circles. McAllister famously claimed that amidst the grandeur of Gilded Age New York, a mere 400 could truly qualify as members of fashionable society. The Queen of Society, as she came to be known, Mrs. Astor solidified her exclusive circle by throwing a grand annual ball on the third Monday of January. Scoring an invitation was seen as the ultimate accolade, the golden ticket confirming one's place within the glittering edifice of New York society. Caroline Astor during this era was renowned for her impeccable grace, scrupulous discretion, and a tongue that never courted controversy. Her amicable demeanor belied a certain detachment. She was never one for unsolicited intimacy, nor was she given to sharing confidences. Her social sphere was rigid, an unassailable bastion of old money, steadfastly unyielding in the maelstrom of changing times and values. Yet for all their staunch traditionalism, the Astors' fame reached far beyond their native shores, their names synonymous with the creme de la creme of the elite. The press found themselves inexplicably drawn to their lives, the grandeur, the scandals, case in point, the affair of Lady Caroline's attires. Much to the delight of the international press, Caroline Astor's sumptuous gowns, intricately adorned with apple green silk, velvet, and ostentatious ostrich feathers, were intercepted by government agents under the suspicion of luxury duty evasion. Months of speculation followed as the world pondered whether Astor would capitulate to the looming charges of $300 to $400. 
Lady Astor remained adamantly defiant, and, in the end, her gowns were put to auction. Curiously enough, it could be suggested that the Astors meticulously manufactured their connotation as old money, cleverly maneuvering the public's perception of older groups as new money. The quintessential example of this was their complex dynamic with the Vanderbilts. The Vanderbilts, a family known for wealth amassed rather than inherited, represented a form of opulence that the Astors found rather gauche and nouveau riche, particularly railroad money which was distasteful in the eyes of Mrs. Astor. As such, she found herself reluctant to entertain the Vanderbilt daughters. Yet, in 1883, she felt compelled to formally acknowledge the socially prominent Alva Erskine Smith, spouse of William Kissam Vanderbilt, granting the Vanderbilts access to the upper echelons of society. A popular tale swirling around the high society circles tells of Alva Vanderbilt orchestrating an opulent costume ball at her residence yet depriving young Caroline Astor, Lena's youngest, of her participation, as Mrs. Astor had not extended a formal call. Observing the Vanderbilt's ascent, Lady Astor, foreseeing the strategic advantage of their alliance in maintaining the exclusivity of New York's high society, extended an olive branch and attended Alva's grand ball. Thereafter, the Vanderbilts were graced with invitations to Lady Astor's annual soiree, symbolizing their official ascension into New York's high society. For our more riveting and detailed account of the Vanderbilt's dramatic rise, fall, and subsequent resurrection, click the video on screen or visit the video description box, and we'll guide you through that immense saga. Now, after the demise of the indomitable Lady Astor, the role of reigning queen of New York society was a mantle too weighty for one woman. The responsibility fell upon the heavy shoulders of three ladies of prestige, Marion Graves' Anthon Fish, the genteel wife of Stuyvesant Fish, Teresa Fair Ulrichs, the glamorous spouse of Herman Ulrichs, and Alva Belmont, who had found a new companion in Oliver Belmont. In this same circle of power and affluence, Mrs. Astor's son, John Jacob Astor IV, a businessman of extraordinary prowess, writer, military officer in the Spanish-American War, sadly breathed his last in the calamitous sinking of the Titanic. With an estate valuing approximately $87 million, a fortune that would be the equivalent of $2.64 billion today, Astor was the wealthiest among the unfortunate souls on the ill-fated voyage, and arguably one of the world's richest men during his time. At the same time, on the other side of the pond, the Astor lineage grew nobler, cultivating its prestige through the illustrious titles of Viscount Astor and Baron Astor of Hever. First, a wealthy American Astor by the name of William Waldorf Astor took the bold step of transplanting himself to the British soils in 1891, later adopting the mantle of British citizenry in 1899. As a mark of his sterling contribution to the wartime charities, he was awarded a baronage in 1916 and elevated to a Viscount a year later. Thus was the birth of the Viscount Astor, granted by the peerage of the United Kingdom on a summer afternoon in 1917, forever intertwining the Astors with the annals of British nobility. In the mid-century year of 1956, another title was fashioned within the peerage of the United Kingdom. This was the title of Baron Astor of Hever, awarded to the influential newspaper baron and conservative politician, another John Jacob Astor, the fourth offspring of William Waldorf Astor, first Viscount Astor. In today's world, certain Astor descendants, such as William Astor, fourth Viscount Astor, persist in wielding their influence, notably in the British House of Lords. However, the family fortune has been eroded over time, with certain heirs grappling with monetary hardships. One poignant symbol of this decline is the family's 420-acre estate, now wearing the signs of neglect due to insufficient maintenance funds. Thus, the Astor name, once synonymous with America's affluent uppermost echelons, has faced a gradual diminution in its prestige. While their mark on New York City's panorama and the American milieu remains indelible, their once venerated status has taken a quiet retreat. Yet for all their dwindling wealth and influence, the Astor lineage has left an indelible legacy on the city that never sleeps. The cityscape is peppered with edifices bearing the Astor insignia, including many streets, buildings and companies. Institutions like the modern St. Regis Hotel and the Astor 
alongside various other landmarks, indeed echo their erstwhile glory. Therefore, the story of the Astor family's evolution from new money to old money serves as a potent reminder of both the importance of diversification and the transience of time and success, no matter what heights of success you reach. And, for what it's worth, the name Astor will always hold weight in the Western world. During the middle of the Gilded Age in the city that never sleeps, where steel meets sky and ambition knows no bounds, two monumental landmarks once soared above the rest, the Astor and Waldorf Hotels. Think of them not merely as hotels, but as palaces of dreams, peak shrines of American extravagance. Erected in 1905, the Astor Hotel was a celestial wonder, an embodiment of Beaux-Arts elegance crowned by a sky garden that almost touched the heavens. Just a stone's throw away, its sibling rival, the original Waldorf Hotel, had already unfurled its opulence in 1893. A monolith of majestic architecture, this masterpiece was conceived by none other than the iconic Henry Janeway Hardenberg, inspired by the lofty German Renaissance ideals. Yet what fueled such grandiosity? Family, or specifically the Astor family, one of America's most storied old money dynasties. William Waldorf Astor graced Fifth Avenue with the Waldorf first, laying down the gauntlet. Not to be outdone, his cousin John Jacob Astor IV took the challenge head on, responding with the Astoria Hotel, each structure a flamboyant rebuttal to the other. And yet, despite standing as monoliths of splendor, these icons of opulence faced an unforeseeable destiny. They eroded, crumbled, and ultimately were razed to the ground. In this thrilling installment of old money mansions, join us as we retell a saga that consistently echoes through the corridors of architectural history. Why were New York's most opulent hotels demolished? In the bustling urban landscape of Gilded Age New York City, amidst Fifth Avenue's burgeoning architectural splendor, emerged the unparalleled duo of the Astor and Waldorf Hotels. Stemming from a family rivalry between the affluent cousins, William Waldorf Astor and John Jacob Astor IV, these luxurious havens were erected as monuments to both grandeur and one-upmanship. It all begins in 1893 when William Waldorf Astor inaugurated the Waldorf Hotel an opulent German Renaissance marvel designed by the eminent architect Henry Hardenberg. Four years thereafter, itching with family rivalry, William's cousin John Jacob Astor IV would grace the adjacent plot with the towering Astoria Hotel, its particular design entrusted to the celebrated architects Schulze and Weaver. However, trouble was soon afoot in the family's game of hotelier thrones. In its inaugural year, William's Waldorf Hotel faced skepticism and was colloquially known as Bolt's Folly, attributed to the proprietor George Bolt, with critics condemning the luxurious hotel as a blight upon a respectable neighborhood. However, parrying the media's doubt, Bolt ingeniously planned a charity concert for St. Mary's Hospital for Children the day after the hotel's opening. With tickets priced at $5, $163 in today's currency, New York's elite filled the grand ballroom, dismissing earlier skepticism. Thus, by the end of its first year in 1893, the Waldorf had generated an incredible $4.5 million in revenue, an astonishing sum for the time that would equal over $100 million in 2023. Not long after, in 1897, John Jacob Astor IV inaugurated the Astoria Hotel adjacent to the Waldorf. Quickly seizing on an even larger opportunity, the cousins soon agreed to a truce creating a unified entity known as the Waldorf Astoria. With 250 feet stretching from the sidewalk to its highest point, this combined colossus reigned as the world's largest hotel, having the buildings eventually being connected through a 300-foot marble corridor known as Peacock Alley. This Peacock Alley was soon seen as a grand promenade for the who's who of New York high society that connected the Waldorf and Astoria hotels becoming an enduring symbol of the combined social and business establishments. Now, at a staggering expenditure of approximately $5 million, equivalent to $138 million today, the Waldorf Hotel graced Fifth Avenue and 33rd Street with its German Renaissance structure, consisting of an impressive 450 guest rooms, 15 opulent public rooms, and an additional 100 rooms designated for staff. Intricate architectural features such as loggias, balconies and gables adorned the exterior. Inside, a breathtaking garden court featuring fountains and terracotta walls offered a sanctuary of splendor. Siena marble, 
mosaic tile floors, and a coffered ceiling framed the entrance hall, immediately declaring the building's opulence to anyone crossing its threshold. Delving further into the Waldorf, you could see a marble entrance that leads to the Empire Room. This dazzling space, furnished with an alcove featuring elevators and a grand staircase, swiftly gained notoriety as one of New York City's premier dining establishments, rivaling even the likes of Delmonico's and Sherry's. You see, the room was an Empire-style marvel, resplendent with mahogany pilasters, gilded accents and lavish frescoes. Adjacent to this culinary delight was the Marie Antoinette Parlour, an elegant reception room graced with 18th-century European antiques, including a cherished bust of Marie Antoinette. Bearing artistic excellence, the ceiling showcased frescoes by Will Hycock Lowe, with the birth of Venus as the central piece. Further enhancing the hotel's splendor was the Gentleman's Café, a hunting-themed sanctuary adorned with robust black oak paneling and staghorn chandeliers. This was complemented by suites such as the Henry IV drawing room, furnished with rare French and Italian antiques, as well as a banquet hall seating 20 and a music room. And while the Waldorf was indeed a paragon of opulence, its sibling, the Astor Hotel, was no less grand. Opened in 1897 and situated at the intersection of 5th Avenue and 34th Street, this 16-story marvel was also designed by Henry J. Hardenberg. Boasting 25 public rooms and 550 guest rooms, its dimensions were grandiose, extending 270 feet from its sub-basement to its roofline. Constructed of stone, marble and brick, its architectural style was a harmonious blend of French Second Empire and Austrian Baroque influences. A double set of plate glass doors graced the entrance, alongside a U-shaped driveway for carriages and horses. As you would navigate the Astor to the left of Peacock Alley, resided the Astor Dining Room. This expansive space showcased Italian Renaissance pilasters, Russian marble columns, and silk hangings in rose pompadour. Directly opposite lied the Garden Court of Palms, a triple-height dining venue adorned with a dome-like roof of amber glass. Here, the Italian architectural influences were elegantly portrayed through grey and terracotta hues, embellished with Pavanazzo marble. The cafe, found on the 34th Street side, was a spacious room finished in English oak and accented with German Renaissance and Flemish decorations. Proceeding to the first floor, you'd find the Astor Gallery, a luxurious space graced with towering French windows and a colour scheme of blue, grey and gold. Nearby, the colonial room contrasted its red ambience with white woodwork, adding another layer of complexity to the design palette. On the second floor, a private suite of apartments in Old English Oak offered a range of amenities, including large drawing rooms and a butler's pantry. And above the third floor, the hotel transitioned to suites and bedrooms, each offering unique luxuries like individual baths and spacious trunk closets. However, the crown jewel in the Astor was undoubtedly the ballroom. Conceived in the Louis XIV style, this grandiose space could accommodate 700 guests for banquets and 1,200 for concerts. Adorned in shades of ivory grey and cream, it welcomed the most cherished voices of its day, with season tickets for musical performances costing up to 350, around 12 grand in today's dollars, underscoring the high value placed on cultural offerings held within these hallowed walls. Upon entering the zenith of the hotel, you'd find a paradisiacal roof garden encased in glass, adorned with rattan furnishings in shades of pale green and pink. A stroll along the 34th Street side revealed the grand promenade, Peacock Alley, a lofty terrace furnished with a bandstand, fountains and trellises. Adjacent was the roof garden restaurant, possessing a high ceiling that stretches 24 feet above the floor. At the corners of this exalted realm were spiral stairways within towers, ascending to the copper roofs of pavilions that stand a staggering 250 feet above the ground level. Thus, from its subterranean machinery to its skyward gardens, from its shaky beginnings to its golden reputation, the Waldorf and Astor hotels embodied both engineering excellence and unparalleled luxury, forever imprinted in New York's architectural and cultural history. Now, from their earliest days, both the Astor and Waldorf hotels became synonymous with glittering social events, with philanthropic dinners and balls frequented by luminaries like Andrew Carnegie. The resplendence extended to hosting dignitaries like Viceroy Li Hung Chang of China, who in 1896 imported 100-year-old eggs and even his kitchen staff, 
Upon his departure, Lee graced every female guest with a basket of roses and lavished generous tips on the hotel personnel. The Astor and Waldorf additionally pushed the envelope in hospitality. From Prince Henry of Prussia, who enjoyed a private door and elevator, to a staff forming an emergency bucket brigade for his royal bath, the level of service was unparalleled. Exclusivity extended to guest policies as well, allowing only registered individuals access to rooms, thereby upholding a superlative standard of etiquette. Membership clubs within the premises offered perks like preferential pricing and discounted spa treatments, attracting an even more elite clientele. The Waldorf Astoria Bar, established in 1893, was the sanctuary of the city's financial magnates and vivid personalities, from Diamond Jim Brady to Buffalo Bill Cody. Even the cocktail world owes its heritage to this establishment, credited with inventions like the Rob Roy and the Bobby Burns. But here's the paradox. The very grandeur that made these establishments landmarks of American luxury also sowed the seeds of their own downfall. As we sit here basking in the glory of the Astor and Waldorf Hotel's most radiant days, a looming shadow creeps closer, whispering a harrowing question that we can no longer ignore. What catastrophic chain of events could pull these icons down from their lofty heights? Sadly, the halcyon days of the original Astor and Waldorf hotels soon met an inexorable decline. Compelled by an interplay of economic downturns, ownership transitions and societal evolution. Thus, as the years marched on, the Astor family's grip on the hotel industry loosened, signaling a change in leadership that would have profound implications. Initially, these grand hotels had captivated New York City, hosting society's elite and even contributing innovations to the world of cocktails and hospitality. They epitomized luxury, becoming glittering settings for illustrious balls, philanthropic dinners, and visits from foreign dignitaries. But as the 20th century unfolded, fresh competitors emerged. Luxurious new establishments like the St. Regis sprung up, endowed with modern amenities that lured away clientele. The Astor and Waldorf found themselves as relics in a city that had moved forward, the glamorous heart of New York City shifting northward beyond 34th Street. Then, the Great Depression struck in 1929, casting a dark shadow over these citadels of extravagance. Eroded by financial constraints, their luster dulled significantly, setting the stage for a diminishing role in a city always chasing the next big thing. Adding insult to injury, the costs of preserving their architectural grandeur began to spiral out of control. Ensuring their structural integrity while maintaining lavish interiors became an insurmountable challenge pushing them further into decline. Furthermore, as New York City evolved, so did its land value. The very ground upon which these hotels stood became coveted real estate, more valuable than the aging structures themselves. This paved the way for the demolition of the original Waldorf Astoria in 1928, making room for none other than the Empire State Building. Yet, although the original Waldorf Astoria was raised to make room for the Empire State Building, the legend was far from over. In 1931, a new Waldorf Astoria was resurrected on Park Avenue, and the name once again captivated the imagination of the public. This new location recaptured much of the original grandeur and became an iconic symbol in its own right, playing host to presidents, celebrities and dignitaries. While it wasn't completely shielded from the economic and societal forces that had impacted its predecessor, the Park Avenue Waldorf Astoria stood as an enduring beacon of luxury, proving that the allure of a name could transcend time and place. Yet, despite this resurgence, a definitive end was marked for the Astor family's hotel empire on May 3, 1929, when they sold their remaining interests to the developers of the Empire State Building. The original structures disappeared, their once mesmerizing elegance archived in the New York Public Library. But the Waldorf Astoria name lived on, solidifying its place as an irreplaceable jewel in the crown of New York City's rich history. Before the democratization of status and social media, where anybody with an iPhone and a bit of cheeky personality could become a megastar thanks to apps like Instagram, TikTok, or, dare I say, even YouTube itself, society certainly had what today we would call influencers, but they were surely a cut above the folly and hijinks exhibited by the Jake Pauls and Kim Kardashians of the world, Indeed, the Astors, 
a lineage directly descended from America's very first multimillionaire, were the epitome of American high society. Holding a family name synonymous with opulence and social influence during the 19th and early 20th centuries. In today's episode of Old Money Luxury, we'll explain, step by step, how this legendary old money dynasty created high society as we know it, wielding social savvy, political clout and strategic marriages to serve as the architects of New York City's social norms for the 1% of the 1%. Long before John Jacob Astor ascended as America's first multimillionaire wealth in the early 19th century, the 13 British colonies, and later the fledgling United States, were already the domain of established families of considerable means. For generations, these families had held sway over the nation's political landscape, and their roots often stretched back to the period before the American Revolution. You see, the forebears of these families accumulated their fortunes through a myriad of avenues, among them elite planters, prosperous merchants, slave owners, shipbuilders. Additionally, geography played its role. In states such as Virginia, Maryland and the Carolinas, acres upon acres of land, either bestowed by British royalty or gained through colonial era so-called head rights, formed the bedrock of these families' prosperity. And their legacy was often not merely one of wealth, but of statesmanship. Indeed, they counted among their numbers several of the founding fathers and the early presidents of the United States, men who would stand in the crucible of revolution and constitutional formation. Yet, with all of that said, the American colonies had been largely peopled by those whom historians describe as the middling sort, what we today would identify as the middle class. Certainly, America was not a land of hereditary aristocracy. Rather, it was a place where wealth alone could elevate one's standing. And the Founding Fathers themselves were instrumental in rejecting monarchy and hereditary aristocracy as they structured the nation's governance. For this, their intellectual inspirations were varied. First, they took cues from Europe's first written constitution, the Magna Carta, celebrating its challenge to monarchical authority. Men like the future third US President Thomas Jefferson saw the new American elite as a natural aristocracy, one founded not on birthright, but on merit and ability. For example, Alexander Hamilton, born out of wedlock and hailing from humble beginnings in the Caribbean, or Benjamin Franklin, a son of a candle maker, could ascend to the pinnacle of American society through sheer grit and intellect. By contrast, Germany, the ancestral home of the Astors, was a veritable mosaic of principalities and kingdoms each underpinned by its own rigid aristocratic structure. Indeed, the Astors could never have ascended the social ladder in their German homeland as they did in America's more fluid society. Thus, as the early 1800s unfurled, America was a land of disparate centers of wealth and influence. Both new money and old money mingled, yet there was no centralized high society. Therefore, America was, at the time, a vacuum that would soon draw in the likes of the entrepreneurial Astors. Now in a nation still forming its identity, John Jacob Astor emerged as an archetype of American capitalism. Born in Germany, he crossed the Atlantic to establish himself as a fur trader and soon became America's first multimillionaire. Specifically, Astor's arrival in New York in 1786 marked the dawn of his business endeavors. Acquiring knowledge of the fur trade during his voyage to the New World, he opened a fur goods shop in Manhattan. And Astor was not one to squander an opportunity. The Jay Treaty of 1794, which opened new Canadian markets and the Great Lakes region, proved fortuitous for him. His shrewd negotiations with native tribes and market insights allowed him to accumulate a quarter of a million dollars by the year 1800, effectively crowning him the undisputed magnate of the fur trade. But John Jacob Astor's ventures were not confined to furs alone. In 1834, the Astor House, New York City's first luxury hotel, welcomed its first guests. Astor had meticulously gathered parcels of land around his previous residence, effectively claiming an entire city block in what was then the city's most elegant quarter. Situated on the west side of Broadway, the Astor House was a stone's throw away from City Hall Park and the offices of the New York Herald. For decades, this establishment remained the lodestar for the elite and the famous, the venue where authors and statesmen mingled in opulent settings. Indeed, it served as the blueprint for the city's future luxurious accommodations. 
Now, the patriarch of the Astor dynasty passed away in 1848, leaving a staggering $20 million, equal to over $770 million in today's currency, almost all of which was bequeathed to his son, William Backhouse Astor. Thus, the provisions of Astor's will were carefully engineered to preserve the family fortune for the generations to follow, a symbol of his calculating mind. By the 1850s, the Astor family had transcended their mercantile origins to become social arbiters of the First Order, and it was Caroline Shermerhorn Astor, William's wife, who most personified this new societal influence. The famed matriarch wielded almost dictatorial control over New York high society, and it was her annual Astor Ball that became the defining event of the city's social calendar. Now, during the 1870s, Caroline Astor, commonly known as the Mrs. Astor, wielded significant influence over American high society. Her Fifth Avenue mansion became the stage for defining the era's social etiquettes, where she hosted elaborate teas, receptions, and opulent late-night dinners. The pinnacle of her social calendar was an annual ball, set meticulously on a Monday night in January, where dinner was served at 11 p.m., and dancing continued until the break of day. Mrs. Astor would commonly be flanked by Ward McAllister, her confidant and co-architect of social exclusivity. Together, they orchestrated the Society of the Patriarchs, a club aimed at consolidating the creme de la creme of New York society. Now, the Patriarchs' balls were recurring events, held multiple times each season at Delmonico's, the city's premier dining establishment. Membership in the society came with certain privileges, each member could extend invitations to five women and four men for the various social events conceptualized by Caroline Astor. Those who met the society's stringent standards were granted entry into the 400, a term coined to represent the elite list of guests who could comfortably fit in Mrs. Astor's ballroom. This exclusive list included individuals of impeccable lineage, grandchildren of past presidents, European royalty, and heirs to monumental fortunes. Indeed, the 400 became synonymous with social exclusivity, setting the tone for who was considered in and out of the upper echelons of American society. Meanwhile, in 1887, Lewis Keller, a society columnist and golf aficionado, published the first social register, taking a cue from Mrs. Astor's famous 400 list. His compilation also included names from other notable lists effectively documenting those who made up New York's most distinguished visiting registers. Overseen by an anonymous advisory committee, the social register initially recorded over 5,000 individuals, many of whom were descendants of early American settlers. Historically, the list catered to American upper-class families, epitomizing the WASP stereotype. Amid this backdrop of social curating, tensions flared between the Astors and the Vanderbilts, the two titan families of the Gilded Age. Alva Vanderbilt, slighted for her absence on Mrs. Astor's coveted list, orchestrated an audacious counter-move. In 1883, after the completion of Petit Chateau, her extravagant Fifth Avenue residence, Alva dispatched 1,200 invitations for her masked ball. Hearing all the society chatter, Mrs. Astor's daughter, eager to attend the Vanderbilt Gala, thus persuaded her mother to pay a visit to Alva. Armed with a useful excuse to finally acknowledge the Vanderbilt's entry into high society, Mrs. Astor joined in Alva's festivities, marking a twisted tale of social rivalry in a setting already steeped in exclusivity and one-upmanship. Now, the Astor-led high society annual social cycle of Gilded Age New York commenced in November and extended until the onset of Lent. During spring, society's finest would frequent the courts of England and Europe only to return for a stateside summer. This recurring sequence of events, including balls and dinner parties, was not just a social fixture, but also held political relevance, as many members of the US Parliament partook in these social rights. Subsequently, Caroline Astor, partnered with her confidant Ward McAllister, aimed to formalize the rules governing this rarefied social landscape. They were the self-appointed guardians of old money propriety laboring to sift the worthy from the unworthy newcomers. However, simultaneously, as the American Astor family's influence was reaching its apogee in the United States, an ocean away, the family's tendrils were extending into British society. In 1893, William Waldorf Astor, disenchanted by familial discord on American soil, took up residence in England. 
and the estate of Cliveden in Taplow, Buckinghamshire, once the province of the Duke of Westminster, soon became the Astor's palatial refuge. Then in 1906, as if anointing the Union of Continents, William Waldorf bestowed Cliveden upon his son, Waldorf Astor, and his new American bride, Nancy Langhorn. Nancy Langhorn hailed from Virginia, born into fluctuating fortunes that eventually swelled by the close of the 19th century. Thus, her marriage to Waldorf in 1906 was something of an international alliance, not only merging family wealth, but also social ambitions. With political aspirations in his eyes and the influence of his well-connected wife, Waldorf became the Unionist candidate for Plymouth in 1908. Nancy, ever the devoted spouse, campaigned ardently at his side, until he took his seat in Parliament two years later. And British society warmed to Nancy, captivated by her American ebullience and sharp wit. Thus, in Albion, the Astors were a harmonious pair, both American expatriates of similar temperament. Remarkably, they were even born on the same day, the 19th of May, 1879. As hostess of Cliveden, Nancy became renowned, drawing luminaries from Charlie Chaplin and George Bernard Shaw to Winston Churchill into their social sphere. Then, in 1919, an unforeseen twist of fate. Waldorf was elevated to the House of Lords, necessitating his departure from the House of Commons. Into the vacuum stepped Nancy, who won his seat and made history as the first woman to sit in Parliament. Over a span of 26 years, she wielded her influence in the advocacy of diverse causes. Shortened working hours, enhanced health care for mothers, pensions for widows, and equal employment opportunities for women. But Virginia always occupied a special place in her heart. A portrait believed to depict Pocahontas was her gift to the Commonwealth in 1926. However, despite her groundbreaking career, Nancy encountered formidable resistance, including from none other than Winston Churchill. Yet her tenure in Parliament set a precedent that reverberated through the halls of power, unsettling traditional gender norms and shaping a new pathway for women in politics. Simultaneously, her wealth, social standing and vast network of connections became essential assets in her political endeavours. Therefore, while the family maintained a formidable presence in American high society, the British chapter of the Astor legacy was inscribing itself. Throughout the 1920s and 1930s, Waldorf and Nancy became staples in the British social fabric. Cliveden was not just their home, but an international salon of intellect, influence and elegance. Nancy, the hostess with an unyielding political spirit, was perceived as among the world's most notable women. Cliveden, the epitome of their transatlantic melding of societies, continued to be the stage for this remarkable American-British drama. But as the fur trade, once a cornerstone of Astor prosperity, dwindled and real estate ventures faced turbulence in an evolving urban landscape, the family found their once impervious status diminishing. Now, the ebbing of the Astor family's fortunes was a gradual process that spanned the late 19th to the 20th century, catalyzed by shifting economic terrains and societal perceptions, and accusations of being slumlords further marred their standing. A maritime calamity, the sinking of the Titanic, cemented a regrettably certain end to the Astor Dominion in New York society. Among the ship's casualties was John Jacob Astor IV, the most affluent passenger aboard. His wife, Madeline Force Astor, survived the tragedy and subsequently gave birth to their son, John Jacob Astor VI, and Madeline herself was a figure of social intrigue, her marriage to John Jacob Astor IV having provoked scandal due to their age difference and his recent divorce. When several clergy members refused to officiate their wedding, the minister who eventually stepped in faced such backlash that he felt compelled to resign. Decades later, as World War II erupted, the Astor influence across the Atlantic saw another significant recalibration. Nancy Astor, now the Viscountess Astor, was deeply engaged in political life and philanthropy throughout the conflict, yet her political standing eroded over the course of the war. Believing her party and husband considered her a liability, she retired from politics in 1945. And World War II itself wrought significant changes on the British home front, including the mobilization of women into various forms of labor Yet it did little to modernize their post-war ambitions, which largely remained anchored in tradition. In the next decade, the 1950s, the divestment of American assets signified another phase in the family's retrenchment. 
John Jacob Astor VI, who was born in the shadow of the Titanic disaster, had overseen the Astor estate in Basking Ridge. But in 1960, he abandoned this property. It laid vacant until its acquisition by Bernard's Township in 1968 for $140,000. Furthermore, the wane of the Astor influence during the latter half of the 20th century symbolized a broader societal shift. The concept of high society, once the near-exclusive realm of white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, began to diversify, making room for emergent families like the Irish Catholic Kennedys. Yet, the Astor legacy is far from erased, and it persists through philanthropic works such as the New York Public Library, a variety of New York City landmarks and streets, and titles that remain with the family's English descendants, including Viscount Astor and Baron Astor of Hever.